Ladies and gentlemen, uh, dear organizers, dear colleagues on Zoom, um, it is my pleasure to be here with you today at ASNAC, and it's my most pleasant obligation to thank uh, Dr. Orl Naismith, who sadly couldn't be here live with us, for inviting and having me, and also Jake Staddle for uh, all his invaluable help along the way, both now and uh, over the past three years, I think, we've, we've known each other. Um, it's my first time here in Cambridge, but I dare hope not the last unless you boot me out for my um, unconventional takes on very, very established matters. And um, I will have to ask you to forgive my mm, sometimes frivolous humor that I allowed myself, such as on this slide. And um, I believe people who have uh, some familiarity with the scholarship of Buckland might recognize what this might represent for, but um, I will come at some point uh, later in my presentation and explain why this is there. Um, so um, I owe the inspiration for my talk today to two people. Uh, one is Dr. John Blair, who a year ago published a lengthy and most in-depth reassessment of the Anglo-Saxon phenomenon of Buckland. The uh, article is dated uh, the year 2020, but it physically came out in 2022. And as you can probably imagine and uh, gather from, I will sorry, just put the slide up. Um, yeah, that's 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 his. <coughs> mm, I'm not sure. You can you can click on the X there. We don't need to see the participant okay. shortcut if you want. To. Um, I'm sh okay. Yeah. Is that better? Yeah. How do I collapse this bar? Um, sorry. Uh, uh, sorry. Um, I mean, it's not very important, but um, it might obstruct the view a little. Does anyone know? Well, um, I'll have to bear. I'll have to ask you to bear with me and just trust my word when I say this is what the slide is about. So anyway, uh, this is the uh, this is the title of uh, John Blair's uh, article, and as you can see, my own presentation today is in direct dialogue with it. I'm not saying confrontation, but dialogue uh, for sure. Um, in my doctoral thesis on things, which I hope to defend this winter, I also came across similar thematics as John Blair in his uh, uh, article. And though they're not my main focus at the moment, questions about Anglo-Saxon land proprietorship and its source base occupy a significant part of my overall argument. Um, the other person to think is uh, Professor Simon Keynes, who is with us today on Zoom. Um, because um, at a symposium uh, two months ago, Professor Keynes raised some uh, reservations concerning Dr. Blair's conclusions, mostly from, as I understood it, uh, the diplomatist's perspective. And I've previously published in a newly started journal, Graphosphere, some of my own evaluations <coughs> of late Anglo-Saxon royal diplomas. Um, in fact, I was uh, very generously given one of the 50 copies that they printed of this particular issue because it was supposed to be a festive um, otherwise, the journal is designed to be uh, online only, but um, this issue uh, was printed uh, to be presented to the, uh, as in Germany they say, Geburtstag Kind, and um, this item will be uh, given to ASNAC. I've already asked Dr. Naismith to kindly accept it as a, I don't know, an, a token of uh, academic um, change, I don't know. Um, so, my novel, the novelty in my, in, in my article there was um, in an attempt to assess uh, Anglo-Saxon diplomas not individually, or as particular series, and not for the lacking of vernacular contents, but rather as a corpus and a mass source to, so to speak, take a, a step back from the trees and look at the whole woods. Uh, but the language of publication may stand, uh, in, in its ba um, stand a barrier in the um, dissemination of the article, I understand it now. And so I took um, a very generous offer by my French colleague from Corpus de la Bourgogne de Moenage. Uh, pardon my French, uh, it's rather faster now. Um, so I will rework um, the, man, the main tenets of uh, this article into English, um, and that will be based on the presentation I did in Kalamazoo this past May. So my, my main aim today is threefold. First, well, I'd like to publicize and subject to scrutiny my approach to Anglo-Saxon royal diplomas with the methods of statistics before I'll take it further in English. 
Second, in the run-up to my thesis final draft, I'd like to subject to your critique and my original and previously not printed contribution to the discussion of Bookland. And third, I hope to bring diplomas and Bookland together in a preliminary synthesis to, if I may be bold, um, maybe even add a new spin on these matters. Um, I'll start with a brief recap uh, of the contentions that I just alluded to above. Um, in the main, Dr. Blair argued in his article that Bookland had always been a Southern English phenomenon inspired by continental dipl diplomatic praxis, and due to various reasons into which we are not going to go right now, Bookland never took any good hold in East Anglia, Lincolnshire, and further in the English Northeast. Here, he suggests, the title to land uh, to have been always rooted in oral testimonies by transaction vouchers rather than in an inscribed solely piece of parchment. Uh, but even in non-Viking Saxon England, or what I in my work for simplicity's sake call Greater Wessex, Dr. Blair argues that, I will quote, Buckland had largely lost its precise and restrictive meaning by at least the 960s and had no precise meaning at all by the 1060s, end quote. Um, as I understood in September, um, Dr. Keynes parried these theses by, first of all, emphasizing the role of monastic archives where diplomas were preserved. Then uh, Professor Keynes brought up indirect evidence to the existence of eastern and northern cartularies once seen by antiquaries but since lost. And finally, Professor Keynes couldn't see eye to eye with the notion of a royal diploma, as I quote Dr. Blair's article again, in prestigious archaism. And that's especially given what we now know uh, about diplomacy production. So let us, for now, proceed from the encyclopedia qualification of Bookland as a land property that definitionally came with a royal diploma, the book, hence the name. The question thus, to simplify, uh, boils down to essentially the representativeness of the available corpus of diplomas. I can, of course, err, but when I started looking at previous answers, it seemed to me that the question has not been given much space for its own sake. At best, the problem of potential skewness is acknowledged, but it had the effects that is um, in the first place. So here I assembled a few um, opinions in the bibliography <coughs> that I came upon. For example, um, Sir Frank Stanton implicitly admitted uh, possible mass losses, so that a diploma might look suspicious only because of its otherwise not parallel formula, but it doesn't mean that such formula didn't exist. We might just not know about them. Um, Professor Keynes, whom I've already mentioned here a few times in his uh, Opus Magnum in the monograph from 1980, expressed a very similar opinion from the perspective of archival preservation. Um, but some colleagues, so for example Cyril Hart, Anthony Syme, and George Molyneux, would rather admit at least a geographic representativeness. Um, this is because East England features good numbers of non-royal chapters and only few king's diplomas, hence their paucity in otherwise functioning archives should speak to their original low quality, uh, sorry, quality quantity. <laughs> Um, various interpretations, furthermore, have been given to the well-known fact that Libellus Ethelwode Episcopi did not bother to mention royal diplomas and land transactions in the Eastern Midlands. Um, conversely, Susan Reynolds admitted that the Libellus could have just omitted references. Um, earlier still, uh, Dr. Anne Williams had opined that many diplomas here perished because of fewer monastic communities in the Danelaw to begin with. So, no archive, no diploma. The same libellus implies that during the conquest, the Dane lowland proprietors either forfeited or had the titles of uh, to land confirmed. But either way, this must have caused some documentary output of which we have no possession. Um, as far as I can tell, the most sequential pro and contra arguments have been proposed by Levi Roach, uh, who, seems, uh, who sees the corpus rather skewed than unrepresentative per se. Another problem is representativeness in time. The most conspicuous zigzag on the chronological graph is the waning diplomas numbers in the 11th century uh, as compared to a century prior. So why is that? Is it because, as it was previously believed, royal diplomas were falling out of fashion as an ostensibly obsolete documentary type and superseded by royal writs? Well, changes clearly were afoot. 
But Professor Keynes persuasively, I believe, demonstrated that despite diplomacy conservatism, they demonstrate enough variation uh, in formulaic conventions to suggest a high degree of adaptivity to newer conditions. Or is it, as Dr. Charles Inslet proposed, because of an ideological change in tides uh, under the Danish dynasty and discontinuity with previous ecclesiastical patronage and endowment? Now, um, for the lack of time, I will have to omit the chronological representativeness for good, but I will be most happy to take it further in the uh, Q&A section. Um, I think there is a message in the chat. Um, the sound and line is very accurate and unclear. Is the room microphone live as well as the mic on the computer? I think it's just the mic on the computer. Um, if you, you sort of stay close to it, sure. should um, help a little bit, but this problem has occurred before. I'm not um, sure there's too much we can do about it. I, I would very much appreciate if Chad could respond to how, or how you hear me now. If you'd like me to speak higher, uh, in a high voice, or sorry, in a louder voice, or... Um, well, I'll carry on for now, and I'll keep the uh, chat probably alive somehow. Oh, right. Um, anyway, I do not see any pop-up messages, so I guess everything should be better. All right. Um, so, for my intents and purposes today, uh, this is the first uh, cluster of problems that need to be done away uh, with before I... Oh, sorry. Um, the chat. Uh, yes, better things. Okay. Um, thank you for alerting us. So these are the first cluster of problems that need needs to be done away with before we can proceed to Bookland itself. Now um, that I've, now that I've hopefully attracted your interest to these research questions, let us take a closer look at the first-hand material to which they pertain, or the very corpus that I've been talking about so uh, extensively, so um, by far. Uh, for the audience as knowledgeable as this one, um, I probably will recap only the single most crucial bare bones fact uh, that are pertinent to this particular study. So the corpus uh, consists of 1875 items as of 1968, plus a handful rediscovered since then. Of this mass, uh, almost 1700 are preserved intact, that is to say we have full text or fuller texts. Um, using the infrastructure of two online projects, Landscape and Languages of Anglo-Saxon Charters, I was able to list down uh, 81 locations where charters were preserved at some point. Um, some were later merged or transferred, and some were on the continent, so um, some are also of problematic identification, and to simplify, by the year 1066, I could count 57 active archives in England. As of 2011, 294 documents existed as single sheets before the year 1100, and the rest are known from cartillary copies. Um, 1,060 of them are royal diplomas, and there offers itself no way of securely establishing which overall number of once-produced diplomas these figures represent. At some point, Professor Keynes noted in passing that at least as regards the years between 925 and 975, the available corpus stands for perhaps one-tenth uh, one of the original <coughs> production. Um, on the other hand, uh, Dr. Alexander Rumble aggregated 29 known names of places of the Buckland type, and four of which uh, were donated in Buckland, oh, I'm sorry, in diplomas. Um, so if we extrapolate, then perhaps our corpus is made of perhaps one-seventh of the original production. But I must stress that all this is very hypothetical and conjectural, of course. So my period of examination and my today's talk, that is between the years 871 to 1066, features diplomas overwhelmingly majority, that is to say 733, including all types of authenticity. And authenticity, as of course everyone who has ever touched the Anglo-Saxon chat is problem, is a very vexed problem. Sadly, we just have to rely on a number of minute features in establishing the reliability of a given document, and so there must exist multiple grades of authenticity. So henceforth, I will normally be operating with those that are considered authentic or to represent an authentic transaction, as, um, as it follows from the sum of opinions listed in the electronic SOEF. 
So according to this criteria, four, oh, sorry, 542 diplomas made the cut for all subsequent number crunching that I'm going to be presenting today. And although I must confess that I may need to revisit them a bit later in view of a new 2020 analysis of Edward the Confessor's diplomas that was performed by Dr. Tom License, of which I didn't know when I originally drafted my um, article. So maybe some alterations are due. Now, if we project these figures on a map, the elephant in the room will be that the archives are not at all evenly distributed across England. So here you can see two maps that I've prepared. Uh, the one on the left um, is where archives are located, the active archives. And the one on the right is where potential archives could have been. By potential, I mean ecclesiastical communities that existed by 1066 but have preserved no documents. So already here, we can observe that the majority of archives gravitate towards greater Wessex. So if we know the objects of royal land donations, the situation becomes very interesting. From a helicopter perspective, on the map on the right, you can see that the donated estates generally concentrate in the same regions as the archives. So there thus transpires a prima facie correlation. But as a famous scientific saying goes, correlation is not causation. We must ask if this distribution is coincidental or not. Now I'll invite you to bear with me and consider two idealistic scenarios. So number one, perhaps the area was covered by documents evenly. Simply speaking, an archive in Shire X preserved documents without any apparent geographic pattern or gravitation towards the Shire X. Number two, it may be that land estates, corresponding diplomas and relevant archives form an inseparable triangle. Simply put, if a king donated land in Shire X, it is with a greater chance that it, um, that it will be preserved in a nearby archive um, that um, was clear, well, was, was um, in the whereabouts of where the estate was donated. So I grant the first scenario is very counterintuitive. We know that monastic communities, as a rule, preserve documents that related to properties of interest of a given communities. And a priori, we may, may be expected that such properties would cluster together. So that is scenario one, uh, scenario two. And this is how things normally are. But not always. There are several cases of a pronounced distance between a land estate and where uh, the diploma has been preserved. So if no triangle can be exposed, that is to say hypothesis one, we would have no other choice but to admit that the map is not that of preservation but of an actual donation policy. I hope you can follow my reasoning here. <coughs> so imagine that we had a lot of, uh, a lot of archives and it didn't matter uh, where um, the archive that preserved the document is located as related to the estate. So perhaps you were a landowner in, I don't know, Yorkshire, but for whatever reason, your diploma was preserved in Winchester. Theoretically, we have to entertain this possibility, although, as I said, it's counterintuitive. So how can this be cross-checked? The brute force method should be as follows. So we put together a list of all chartered uh, objects, put them on a map, and then measure the average and mean distances between them and the archives in which uh, the preserved uh, documents uh, got dep uh, deposited. And this is actually the direction in which I went, but with a significant modification. Um, I chose as my object of measurement the shire in which this or that estate lay, rather than mileage separating an estate from the archive. This was, of course, a forced concession in order to make the already gargantuan task feasibly manageable by just myself. Um, as a parallel cross-check, what I did is performing the same measurement for further three categories of Anglo-Saxon documents, royal rates, wills and testimonies, and finally, non-royal donations. And for them, for these three, I drew no chronological cutaway line at any date because they're just not as numerous and so they're much more manageable by, again, myself alone. So when completed, the data set included 741 documents, that was a long Excel sheet, and uh, almost 1,300 individual land estates, or better to say objects of donation, and if th there should be um, any questions regarding the terminology, 
I will be happy to expound upon it because um, in some minor cases we're not comparing apples to apples. It's, for example, a house in, in a town that has been donated. But again, we had to make some concessions. So with these numbers, you can imagine that it would have been just impossible for just myself without a proper database, without a proper infrastructure to measure those distances and just put them all in one big, big Excel sheet. That was just um, not very manageable. But, um, and of course I have to say that these methods are somewhat flawed because the borders of the shies are arbitrary, they are administrative borders. Um, and some um, shires are much bigger than others. You can compare Yorkshire, which is itself like half of England, I guess, and the minute Rutland. So sometimes it's not exactly the best comparison, but the providence is always on the side of a bigger battalion, as I think Napoleon is said to have said. So we have 33 shires. So it should even out eventually somehow. So um, when I looked at... Um, these data put together, what I got was that 64% uh, percent of all charters in a given archive would relate to estates in the same shire as the archive, and 25% to estates in contiguous shires. By contiguous, I just mean shires that share the same border. Um, that would be the upper line, uh, the upper row on, in the table. So that is 89% combined. Uh, for wills, the breakdown is more evened out, 42 and 41 percent accordingly, but that might just be because of how small the corpus of wills is. It's just 60 items, so distortions are rather probable. Um, as for diplomas, and that's the lowest uh, row on this um, table, 67 percent will be about the estates in the same shires as the archives of preservation, and 24 percent in contiguous shires. If we switch the objects, we shall find out that, on average, 33% of estates in a given shire would be known from diplomas from archives in the same shire, and further 40% from diplomas in contiguous shires. So, essentially, I did the same thing, but I just looked at, at how the estates are described. Not what, the, not what the diplomas describe, but how the estates are described, but basically the same, the same principle. So at this stage, the bottom line has to be that the first scenario is just not viable, and that yes, indeed, Dan is just substantiated with a lot of number crunching, the intuitive fact that for an Anglo-Saxon document to survive, there needed to be a monastic community nearby to begin with. So Captain Hindsight is probably my um, biggest inspiration, I guess. But we can go even further, because even with the archived area, diplomas are distributed hugely disproportionately. I'll save you all the details in the interest of time, and I will just highlight the fact that the top two archives, Abingdon and Winchester, lead only because of their particularly long cutleries. We therefore may suspect that the picture before us reflects preservation more than production. Um, yeah, I should have probably put up this, um, the, these numbers um, slightly earlier. Um, so this is where my work stalled for a few months because it seemed to me that the diplomatic source base was just too skewed and too arbitrary to talk about any long-term and general pre conquest world policies in donating land. And then I saw that my university offered a course in statistics. And this is the last thing I remember and <laughs> from them. And I woke up a few months later with an essay in my hand in which I tested, using statistical methods, the following also intuitive hypothesis. Uh, again, I will ask you to bear with my um, uh, Captain Hindsightness. So, what if West Saxon kings exercised land patronage not arbitrarily, but where, first of all, they had resources to donate? Simply put, a king would give out land where there was some land to donate that he could have disposed of. So, now arguably, there must be many more ways to statistically testing this. Once again, I reiterate a very intuitive supposition, but with so many unknowns and with so many distorting factors, um, in the distorting factors and how the initial data set actually looks, um, I considered that it would be best to apply only two methods that they taught me in the course. And this is where I will genuinely ask your forgiveness for um, uh, propagating statistics in this audience because it might might actually be daunting. It took me quite some time to uh, wrap my head around it as a humanist, but 
I will try to be pedagogical, as they say in my home university. So the two methods that I used uh, were the so-called piercing correlation and linear regressions. Essentially, they do one and the same thing, but they just do it, they give you different results. Um, but they, in the ideal world, should one or the other way complement each other and, might, and must be explicable in the suggested hypothesis. So um, the piercing correlation, I will tell you the nitty-gritty mathematical details of how it works. And this is not least because I'm a user of these methods and not a statistician or mathematician myself. But suffice it to say for now that Pearson correlation is a coefficient in the range from minus one to one. And this number represents the linear correlation between two variables. So on this in this example that I pulled off from the internet, thank you Google, um, what they measured was the correlation between the uh, age of a plant and its size. Because intuitively, we would expect that the older a plant, the bigger it would get, and this is how this um, and this is how Pearson correlation can help you determine if it is uh, correlated or not. So what you would do, you would collect a lot of data points. So for example, you would have 40 uh, plants, and you would measure their size and you would measure their age. So you would need two columns of, of data. Then you would run it through some mathematical mumbo-jumbo, which I don't know how it works, and would give you a correlation coefficient. If it is zero, it means that there is no correlation at all. If it is minus one, which is now a realistic scenario and which is highly improbable, it's that there is not uh, that the correlation is negative. So that is opposed of what we expected. So the bigger the plant, the younger it is, which is counterintuitive. And of course, the opposite is. If it's zero, or if it's one, that means that there's a direct correlation between the age and the size, which is not possible because there are many more factors to the size of a plant than just its age, its species, its conditions, and yada yada. But normally you would expect something in, in the range of 0 0.7 to say it's a strong correlation. So this is one method. The other method is a linear regression. Essentially, it's a similar thing in that you would have two columns of data points and they could be the same as, as just explained here. And again, I'll save you the ins and outs and just uh, try to visualize it with this slide. So what you would get, you would build a formula that would, if you put it on a graph, produce a line. It's always a linear, because it's a linear regression, it's always a line. Um, that is predictive of how your data points should behave if you change one of the variables, one is dependable and one is independent. So here, what we can see is that um, if we change the age of, the, of a given plant, it would normally go up by the coefficient of something. This coefficient is measured by the slope of how, this, of how, this, how steep this line is, which is not really important right now. Um, so essentially it's the very same thing. It doesn't tell you the causal relationships. It doesn't tell you if one causes the other. It says that one affects the other. Again, in, in case of plants, it's a very, high, a very natural assumption that we're playing here with. Um, the strength of a model or its viability is usually measured with the so-called R squared. Again, I'm not going to... I'm not going to explain all the details, it's very long, but otherwise it's known as the coefficient of determination, which can be between 0 and 1. And the closer it is to 1, the more linear the determination. Again, in an in a unrealistic scenario, if you would get the R squared at 1, all your data points would align with the line. So basically, it just says that your model works in 100% cases. Here, for example, the R squared would be 0 0.8, which means that 82% of your data points are explained by this model, and some of them are not. Um, so I hope that was not too complicated. Um, we also have to take into account the p-value. The p-value is, by and large, a way to um, assess if the uh, numbers you got, if the coefficients you got, if they're completely arbitrary or not, because it might just happen that it's just a statistical error, that you got a number that looks appealing and that may be explainable, but it's just an error. Everything that is above 10% is considered irrelevant, considered too high of a marginal error. So, okay, with this out of our way, what can these methods show us? Well, first, I ask myself how the royal resources are distributed. And for that matter, I use the Pace Doomsday resource and just typed in Edward 15, which is the code name for Edward the Confessor, and saw how his revenues are uh, located on the map. Um, 
by revenues, I understood what in the Doomsday Book the scribes entered as uh, valued or valid. Value, which is itself a problematic thing, but um, here I side with the explanation provided by uh, Stephen Baxter and Chris Lewis, that is, it's a yearly income that a manor holder would usually uh, get from a given manor. So, um, I looked at Doomsday Book and how this data fight with the Confessor's possessions look on the map, and uh, what exactly, is, um, yeah, we would have to extrapolate, of course, because that's Edward the Confessor in 1066, recorded in 1086, and we're dealing with chapters that pertain to, a, to 200 years before. So, that's not perfect, but that's the best we have, and speaking from this Canadian perspective, we don't even have that. So, a man abides here. So, uh, I ran these tests, and what I got is that the monetary value of royal properties uh, did moderately correlate, according to Pearson, with the overall economic development of a given shire measured as the aggregate monetary assessment of a given shire property and their value. So you would have, I don't know, 100, 100 manors in a given shire, they would be given a value, for example, 1,000, and uh, that would be, I would be comparing how more often it is that a king would have more value in a shire um, if it is a shire that is of higher value itself. I see, I hope you're following my idea. So, if it is an economically developed shire, we might expect that the manners would be more productive. We might expect that the royal power would, would move in there, first and foremost. So, um, then I needed to test if these aggregates could have been determined by the royal properties to begin with. So, what if we're seeing actually, what if, what is the, what if the causal relationship is reversed? A shire is assessed very high because the king owns so much there. In that case, we're just going in circles, right? So, um, the long and short of it was a rather low R-squared for royal manners, which explained only 34% of the variativity. That means that the model is not very, very explanatory. That means that the uh, royal income was not predetermined by the cumulative, cumulative um, income in a given shire. So, simply put, the royal income was higher in more economically developed shires, surprise, surprise, but economic development did not determine where kings would seek profit. If we look at this map from Hayes Doomsday, we might assume that royal monetary income was evenly spread across the country, because this is how the visual of it would look. But once we start charting it, it will appear that 66% of Edward's income came rather from only 10 shires, and 9 of them in Greater Wessex, and only one is Northamptonshire. So, don't, don't, trust, don't trust your eyes, <laughs> trust your mathematical thinking. So, to drive my message home, despite the lapse of decades since the conquest of the Danelaw, two-thirds of a royal income uh, was still generated in Greater West, West, and that outside, despite the fact that outside there was money for grabs. So, back to charters. How do estates donated in them compare to these data? I will probably hardly surprise you, but the number of individual estates donated with means of royal diplomas in a given shire and the number of hides in them correlate rather all right with the aggregate value of royal manors in the same shire in 1066. So uh, you can ignore this number because expectedly um, you would have a very high correlation between how many estates were given and how many hides were given in a given shire. That's just expectable. But you can see that the values are 0 0.6 and 0 0.7, which is a rather good, well, it's a rather good, um, rather good number here. Good number. Mm -hmm. Objective, Dennis, objective. So, um, um, where was I? So, then, I also ran uh, two linear regression models. First, I tested the dependence of uh, numbers of donated heights, and second, I changed it for the number of individual donated estates. That's point two. Again, you can ignore most of the nitty-gritty details here. I'll try to explain it, and I'll try to translate these figures into normal English. In a hypothetical scenario, if we could have increased Edward the Confessor's income in a given shire by 100 pounds, in 51% of cases, half, the number of hides he and his predecessors since 871 had together donated would have increased by 94. That's almost a linear regression, that's almost one to one. Um, and in 39% of cases, the number of individual essays would have risen only by six, which is not as good of a, of a model. And I understand that these figures are hard to wrap, um, uh, wrap, wrap your head around when it hurts, so I invite you to take a look at these scatter plot diagrams 
that graphically describe these regressive, regressive models. And here, again, using the opportunity, I will again try to explain how a linear model works. So the line here on the, on the, on the, in the graph says how it should work, given the data that I put in the machine. And the individual points represent how the actual shy is behaved according to the data that I uh, put together. So, um, you might remember that I mentioned the problem that Abingdon and Winchester contain a disproportionate number of diplomas gathered in mostly only three cartilaries. And as you can see in these diagrams, Wiltshire, Hampshire, and Berkshire divert strongest. Here, though the king in 1066 collected a lot of revenues, the dynasty had given out much more resources than the models otherwise predicted. So we can, of course, ponder what if we didn't have those three cartilaries? What if they all burned? And this is exactly what I decided to try. I just removed the data, first I removed the data from these cartilaries from the models, and what happened was that the models just stopped making any sense. They just became dysfunctional. Um, then I tried a different thing. I tried removing not the data from these cartilaries, but the data from about these three shires. So imagine one had 30, not 33. And the same effect. Um, the models just stopped working, so there was no significant correlation, there was nada. Which, to me at least, would suggest that um, the models are not perfect, and they do not explain the data set perfectly, and this is probably because there are some factors that were missing here and that we just don't know. Um, but I think it stretches the boundaries of possible to assume that royal patronage was completely independent of royal resources, and it is almost impossible that Abingdon and Winchester materials are so unique that without them, the otherwise historically tenable explanations just collapse. Occam raises says no. So instead of asking what if we, or how did it happen that so many diplomas ended up in Winchester and Abingdon, the, qu the proper question is probably, how did it happen that these got preserved in only three cartilaries? That's the miracle. Not that there were so many um, diplomas to begin with. Uh, although I'm pretty sure that Professor Kings will probably argue with me on this account, but this is at least what my uh, statistical modeling would um, suggest to me. So, I will pause here for a second and uh, let you rest and let the I fear baffling number crunching sink. So, what we're getting at is this. So, on the one hand, because the first idealistic scenario of document deposition did not work at all, so I'll reiterate, 89% of diplomas in, a, in an archive pertain to the same uh, and contiguous shires. So, because of this, I believe Professor Keynes must be right when he objected to the idea of royal, royal diplomas not circulating in the Dane law en masse, if argued diplomatically. Uh, or diplomatistically, if that's a word in English. <laughs> um, not sure you might want to correct me here. So to polemicize, had there been more monasteries and nunneries east of the Alfred Gothram border, perhaps the documentary coverage would have been more even across the country. But secondly, on the other hand, in the area where there used to be many archival hotspots, um, donations and diplomas did not spread evenly. So they clustered a lot in central Wessex, um, despite there being archival possibilities for documents to get deposited elsewhere. And this fact, contrarily, grist to Dr. Blair's mill, in the late Anglo-Saxon period, royal land donations recorded on parchment do not do have a pronounced regional balance, uh, bias. Now, with such imperfect models as above, it is hard to measure it, but to deny it would be just unreasonable, I would believe. And this is where I turn to the second item of the day, the Buckland itself. What my analysis so far, I hope, has shown and probably persuaded you of is that the royal diplomas as titles to land likely saw use of various intensity from shire to shire. I understand this is a circumlocution, but it is designed to be this way. So no more, no less. I first discussed not Booklands, I discussed diplomas. So, does it mean that the shires of lesser diplomatic land conveying, uh, laying, can, no, I'll rephrase that, sorry. Does it mean, though, that in shires of lesser diplomatic land conveyance, uh, bookland was unknown? This is the point I'm going to be refuting in the second half of my talk today. So, why, what do we know about bookland to begin with? 
Um, I believe that Dr. Blair began his 2022 article by posing the question of what the devil is Falkland? So much discussed before, because how many times do we have this word in the corpus? Eight. <laughs> Not much to go about, to be completely honest. And I humbly believe that uh, Dr. Blair just crossed all the T's and dotted the I's concerning Falkland. But what article took for granted was the definition of Bookland. And this is where some problems may begin, or as I call them in my thesis, the Bookland Bermuda Triangle. So the word itself is registered um, a little higher, uh, 47 times in the Toronto Old English Corpus, and in them elucidating uh, are only a few. Late professor and Dr. Patrick Wormel famously publicly characterized Bookland as, I quote, one of the most fearsome devices on the Anglo-Saxon's workbench. And in his unfinished second volume of The Making of English Law that Dr. Lambert so kindly alerted me to, this metaphor looks even more graphically daunting. I quote, one of the most hideously rusty and toothy saws on the Anglo-Saxon's woodshed. Hence the saw to begin with in the uh, introduction. Um, but Dr. Wallman himself meticulously and in his own way elegantly crowned and gave the finishing touches to a long series of studies of Bookland that saw it um, in the triad of folk, land, and bookland. In brief, the argument, as you are truly familiar with, goes as follows. Before the conversion, the only transfer of, of Anglo-Saxon land property had been possible by fixed and said, unrecorded family rules. So that's an argumentum excellentio by itself. This impeded endowment of the newly introduced church. The juridical nature of the privilege, therefore, consisted of the theoretical immunity to the donated, uh, of the donated land to familial claims uh, for constant redistributions. The economic nature of the privilege, at least in the early period, must have consisted of the rights to fiscal and um, judicial revenues that otherwise were a regal prerogative. And here I base my interpretation also partially and greatly, I believe, actually, on Dr. Lambert's uh, book from 2017. So, expectedly, from early on, Bookland possessed great temptation to laity because it allowed them a freedom of inheritance and will making. So, consequently, in the 8th century, the church lost its monopoly on Bookland. Um, the concession was achieved by laying the so-called common burdens on all bookland holders, ecclesiastical and lay. In this wise, what had started as a way to break free from constraints of traditional heirdom, in essence, became a hereditary type of land property, so a little ironic. When exactly this conceptual flip-flop took over is hard to pinpoint, because the first reliable outright indication of bookland's hereditary quality comes from the year 779, which is long after later became a beneficiary in world nations. Uh, the word, the old English word Bookland, first pops up in the corpus in the first third of the 9th century in Kentish documents associated with Archbishop Wilfred. By then, it seems to have already developed the semantics of heritable land. Intriguingly, two contemporaneous uh, Kentish requests that obviously dispose of previously booked lands call their object of disposition with the Old English word irve, that is literally inheritance. Uh, that this practice of bequeathing booked lands continued in the 10th century gets a confirmation in at least 14 royal diplomas whose estates reappear in wills for the same beneficiaries. So, very, very much straightforward. And this elegant uh, tripartite bulk land fault and division commands a great explanatory force. But it also runs a risk of sometimes bringing to an extraneous orderliness into a tidy, less historical fact. To a less tidy historical fact, I, forgive me. To start with, uh, it is the, the trust that we have to put um, into the self-presentation of diplomas. Um, it has for some time been acknowledged that, to quote Drs. Woolman and Blair once more, Anglo-Saxon charters say both less and more than they mean, and do not uh, necessarily say what they mean. Um, the privileges that they so repetitively announce could be, and frequently were overrun. Booked lands were liable to confiscations and reshuffling. The theoretical freedom of disposition in reality often relied on a royal sanction. All the diplomas occasionally got annulled. The only known record of the so-called obligations of charter, if it at all can be trusted because it's associated with Archbishop Wollstone, so this seems to not exempt the master of the land from the uh, uh, other burdens put on the land. Despite the formal immunity to public renders, beside the common burdens, 
Upon introduction in 1012, the holders of Brooklyn probably had to pay Herigeld on a sheer lexical level that Old English word, the English, English word Bookland was coined to describe the phenomenon of chartered land donated by kings to a church. That is maintained on the evidence that the Old English word book often meant a royal diploma. But this lexical sense of Bookland manifests itself only once uh, during the, um, in the whole corpus, which is 47 instances. And it does so in a time in the lit uh, and in the literary environment that when the word was already used in a general sense hereditary property. So another problem is how Bookland largely depends on uh, its antith antithetical nature uh, compared to Falkland and Landland. So Dr. Blair rather persuasively, I think, explained Falkland as to simplify fiscal land rather than a blanket category of all non-booked lands held by popular restrictive customs. Uh, that, and this very custom that Bookland was meant to circumvent is to be perfectly candid, reconstructed mostly retrospectively. Bluntly put, to postulate, postulate lands in a, in a alignability outside early Anglo-Saxon king groups, one has to read the dispositive formulae in charters as introducing something radically innovative. But why couldn't they have just not confirmed what had already existed? Why couldn't they just say, yes, this is, this is how, how this land may be donated without a royal intervention? So to make things even more complicated than they already are, the word uh, loan land or land land in English is even rarer than book land. And it appears only six times. And as a phenomenon rather than concept, loan land demonstrates highly plastic features. And these obscure its rough and ready distinction from Buckland, as for example suggested by soliloquies. On a lexical level, temporary grounds could be booked, the word is used. Um, practically, they could be bequeathed. Um, they were not always exempt from the common burdens. Um, they could be given as a mourning gift. Um, what few royal leases survive took the lexical and material guise of regular royal diplomas. The right to heritable disposition of Lee's land frequently went under a classical synthetic formula to hold and give to whomever he or she likes, which is a, usually understood as a bookland formula. And finally, there has been reconstructed a whole separate category of temporary tenure held ex officio from the king. So apparently, the only juridical aspect that seems to meaningfully distinguish loan and bookland is the expected reversion to the lesser at the expiration of a lease or an account of a leaseholder's crime. In the famous Pont Hill letter, all of Helmstone's ear fair, you remember, means inheritance. So all of it was confiscated by a king's reeve, but his land or loan land reverted to the owner, Odloff. It is probable that Helmstone's ear fair was Buckland, and some pontifical, pontifical leases uh, stipulate immunity to forfeiture among their conditions of tenure, and so do two wills and one spurious royal revisioner grant. Nonetheless, it is just as possible that this theoretical principle might have malfunctioned in practice. Um, this is at least um, very much suggested by literary mentions concerning church lines. And an exacerbating factor could have been the waxing effective power of West Saxon dynasties that enabled them enforcing more onerous claims, as, for example, discussed by Dr. Lambert in his book. So I believe that this ideal bookland folkland triad might well explicate early to mid Saxon social legal conditions of tenure, but the more time passed, the more inevitable shifts and transformations were. So Dr. Rory Naismith, for example, uh, has persuasively demonstrated that in about a century before the Norman Conquest, land was being exchanged much more freely and actively than before, which would suggest that these restrictions might have been already diluted. And we should not forget that the book, land, and Falkland triad is built out of necessity, largely on documentation mostly confined to Greater Wessex, where we begin. So the assumption that non-West Saxon lands were governed by the same rules remains, well, strictly speaking, only an extrapolation. And many of such stampers have been recognized before. I do not mean that these incongruences negate the general validity of uh, the tripartite scheme per se. Rather, I believe, they suggest treating it more as a serviceable but nevertheless approximation only. So there are just too many reservations, concessions, and exceptions. 
Perhaps, and this is the idea I entertain in my thesis, it is worthwhile to view Anglo-Saxon tenural forms less as discrete and mutually exclusive and more as located along some sort of spectrum of greater or lesser freedom from encumbrance, with some transitional gray zones in between. An aspect that I believe should warrant our attention is that of sociolinguistics. So, Bookland from the uh, tripartite model had uh, been, um, in, it might have been in, inadequate in regard to the actual Anglo Saxon tenural conditions, and here I concur with Dr. Blair. Uh, but the word Bookland still found application in King Ethelred and King Canute's laws, for example, rather late. Moreover, uh, the respective clauses present rather strong royal claims and control of land. And this indicates, at least to me, that the word Bookland was not necessarily used ad libitum, because that would mean that the royal power was very much confined to this Danelaw West Saxon border, and that the kings would promulgate their laws and claim exclusive rights but not trespass anywhere which is under the so-called Danish law, which in at least King Canute's laws does not seem to be the case. And in King Canute's laws, I, rem I rem will remind you, the claim is that a thief will forfeit his land to the king. So that is a rather strong claim, I believe, but probably Dr. Lambert will add a little more on this. So let us now consider other known terms for at least uh, for the least incumbent terms of land proprietorship. Two among them, and two, the mo two of the most readily available, arguably were Landrika and uh, Sako on Sokan or Sakon Sok. So these have been exhaustively studied by, again, Dr. Lambert, um, also by uh, Albert Fenton, uh, who studied the Ritz. So um, I'm now deferring you to uh, their studies that had been uh, before me and which I myself rely upon. So both Landrika and Seiken So saw using royal documentary and legal prose, so that's a fact, just like Bookland. But both seem to have originated outside the royal chancery and in social linguistic environment removed from it. Uh, by King Canute's reign, Seiken So had become geographically unrestricted, but it first circulated for about half a century in exclusively Scandinavian contexts. Later still, with one anomalous exception, Doomsday Book provided a separate list for holders of soak only for Yorkshire, Lincolnshire, Nottinghamshire, and Derbyshire. Furthermore, um, don't ask me how much time it took me, it took me some, um, I counted 503 mentions of Latin word Saka et Soka in Doomsday Book, and when I mapped it, I calculated that 469 of them belong to the Danelaw Shires. Of course, it will depend on how you define which shire should belong to the Danelaw and which shouldn't. So, for example, Staffordshire, or, yeah, maybe, maybe it's a good question, or as it's for one. But nevertheless, uh, even if you exclude some of them and if you reshuffle them, the, the, the results will be just very unilateral. So, I believe that the pre conquest possessors of such revenues and use passed under various vernacular lexemes, and Landrika was one of them, and it appears to be synonymous with the old English word uh, plaffer or landplaffer. And here I again believe that um, landplaffer and, and um, uh, plaffer could be used interchangeably. There are just very good textual evidence that they were understood as referring to one in the same category according to the contents. Curiously, however, Landrika first occurred in laws aimed at the Dane law, and only in Archbishop Wilson's lexicon, which itself is permeated with Norse borrowings, does it lose its geographical anchoring. Nevertheless, one of the manuscripts of King Canute's uh, code contains a very important continuation of Wilson's original text, um, where all other versions read that false witnesses must pay a fine to the king or Landrika, manuscript Codonero AI, or A1, adds, who has his soak? So, a Canterbury glossary from roughly the year 1000 renders Latin fundus as Bokland vel Landrike, although I have to confess that the precise meaning of this gloss eludes me in terms of word morphology, because um, if Landrika here is understood as a noun, then um, the grammar just doesn't, the, the case doesn't work out, because fundus is accusative plural, Bokland can be accusative plural, but Landrike cannot. To be accusative plural, it might mean um, a province. Uh, we have this word Landrike in, for example, some of Alfred's translations, 
but that just doesn't make any sense here. Why would it? So the plausible explanation that I find is that it's just the, uh, the signal of weakening of unstressed vowels in old, like old English. So checks out. Um, we can take this even further. In um, uh, the Nathambrian's priest laws, uh, there is a reference to land proprietors who, owes, uh, who owe their fines to the king, and the tax also paid Landrico with King Stain, who too owes the crown his punitive fines. So um, you can probably already see where I'm going with this. It seems suspiciously likely that, the, that what we're seeing uh, is a practical property phenomenon known as Buchland, but simply under other names. So importantly, and this is where my things come in, I'll probably have to rush a bit, um, because I can see people uh, already leaving. So, um, crucially for our intents and purposes, um, late Anglo-Saxon um, um, legalists saw people uh, referred to as King Stains and people uh, holding booklands as probably one and the same thing. It doesn't mean they had to be, but at least this is what follows from the collation of two um, uh, codes by King um, Ethelred, which are pre Wollstone. So, um, why this is so, I believe that in Ethelred III, the word was Hingstein rather than Buckland, or rather the idea was expressed without Buckland, because Buckland simply meant lesser things in, in, in the Dingo, just didn't ring the bell, whereas the word thing was familiar already. So, if we now look at Doomsday Book and pre conquest evidence combined, um, well, I will have to ask you not to read it uh, from, from the screen. This is just to show that I did my homework. Um, but essentially, and to simplify things, um, it seems that there, there appears a lot of conceptual and lexical overlaps between how different people record one and the same um, social group or social category, the land property that defines it, and um, the rights that pertain to them. So we see that apparently kings formulated their uh, requests and their imposts in traditional monarchocentric, I call it, language. Uh, they would consider anyone who holds uh, land which is of a freest type um, their thing, and they would consider that any person such as that would be holding a booklet. It doesn't mean that people who were thus called actually saw eye to eye to these denominations. But I believe this is the least forced explanation of why we see so many overlaps which sometimes are just incongruent with each other. Uh, for example, we have Alodiari who hold uh, the sacred so, and so, and this is only peculiar in Kent. What this means is that probably here they just chose a different word to describe it, but the <laughs> idea was the same. So, um, how this came about, um, I teased it a little in um, Durham. Um, so I will only reiterate that my hypothesis is that when the uh, West Saxon monarchy expanded in the Danelaw under King Edward, what they did, they brought with them the same um, uh, impositions on land and on people holding them as they were used to in West, uh, in West uh, Wessex. And um, the language of the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle is very, very, very uh, suggestive here. People yield, people choose the king as, his, as their lords, their protector and pa patron, and um, this immediately reminds me of Swerian, this, this template of how a commendation formula has to, uh, has to be a, a sworn. People have to choose the will of the Lord. And again, we cannot really distinguish the personal from the political here, but I believe this is just very indicative. And um, apparently this worked, because in the same libellus that I already mentioned, there is a very famous case when uh, there was a uh, lawsuit in Hertfordshire, Oh, sorry, Hunt Huntingdonshire, and from, from it we can establish that what happened was that when King Edward would move into a given territory, he would make a proverbial um, timed and um, high to refuse binding offer um, of either, have your, uh, either confirming your lands or forfeiting them. That doesn't mean that these lands had to be booked in the, on the West Saxon template. It means that the impositions were done on the West Saxon template and that the language of these impositions was West Saxon. What were the people called uh, in Wessex who usually held these encumbered lands? Thanes. What was the land known in Wessex? What was the, what was the term? Bookland. And this is how we get to the Doomsday Book, which seems to be a mishmash of everything. So, um, to begin where I started, so was Buckland an exclusively Southern English or Greater Wessex phenomenon? Um, 
And surprisingly, the answer is yes or no. Yes, in the modern scholarly sense, Bookland, that is, that is land that was conveyed by royal diploma, that probably didn't proliferate in the Dane law if my calculations hold any water. But surprisingly, it's also a no answer, because in the sense of a historical property phenomenon, it seems to me that West Saxon kings opposed the same encumbrance uh, on the conquered land in the same West, uh, in West Saxon terms. So in this sense, yes, it existed, but it wasn't booked. So perhaps the answer to this question is itself a question. So why, why is Bookland and where did it exist? Well, it depends on who's writing, so who's asking. With that, I think I have stretched your uh, patience with me. I thank you very much.